you can't get away from it right now. You can't get away from the fact that the NHS is crumbling and the whole UK is terrified. The only possible excuse I can think of for not giving funding to someone that sick has got to be that they've gone, look, wartime protocol. I do really feel that her legacy should live on as someone who had a lot of very wise and very helpful and very brutally honest things to say about EDs that, that are genuinely powerful. So hello, you wonderful citizen of YouTube, and welcome to a really quite tragic and very, very frustrating eating disorder related video that I had my attention drawn just the other day to the fact that an eating disordered TikToker called Amy Ellis had recently lost her life due to her disorder. And the details of Amy's life and her case are such a glaring example of how broken the mental health care system is in the UK and how broken the NHS in general has become. Because I feel, and I think probably a lot of people feel, that the intense level of suffering and everything that Amy went through before she passed away, it shouldn't have happened. It should not have got that bad. She should not have lost her life. The fact that she wanted to live is something that really shone through in so many of her TikToks. And the fact that she was fundraising, trying to do everything she could to get treatment, she really did not want to die. And that's, that's the really tragic thing. I was not actually aware of Amy on TikTok before somebody called Jasper reached out and told me everything on Instagram and Jasper seemed like they'd been really touched by Amy in her life and then in her passing too that she did seem like one of these people who really had a big personality and a big heart even in such a sick state. I generally avoid the ED side of TikTok quite a bit because it, it does seem so gratuitously triggery <laughs> and kind of a little bit toxic but Amy's page was completely the opposite to all of this, that she was not gratuitous in any way about the things she showed. Instead, she used her words and she used her words beautifully when it came to talking about her ED, that she talked brutally honestly about some of the stuff she was going through now as a very low weight anorexic. And some of this stuff, I like it had never happened to me. I'd never realised like Obviously, this is going to happen. If you waste away this much, this is what's going to happen to your body and your organs and your muscles. And wow. And I think some of the stuff that Amy talked about is, is some of the most incredibly genuinely dissuading stuff when it comes to EDs and low weights. That if you're someone who is ED'd and you have kind of got your brain set on a very low weight. Anything you see that is, you know, a low weight picture or something about being a low weight, it just triggers you to go after it harder. I think Amy's content would actually put some doubts in your mind about, do I really want to go through that though? But Amy in better days, it sounded like she'd actually lived a really, really vivid, interesting cool life for someone who had been sick for most of her life but had kind of kept it vaguely in check for a lot of years. She'd managed to move abroad. She'd lived in America. She'd lived in Canada. She'd done a lot of fundraising for charities. She'd been married once. I saw her video about this is the life I had. Seemed like she was part of the alternative scene as well, judging by how she was dressed. So that's really cool. Um, <laughs> so she'd had this, she'd had this whole really cool life until her ED took it all away from her in, you know, the literal sense, but also it made her so sick that she had to move all the way back to Wales and live with her parents again. And I, I can't imagine how awful that must feel to have had such a hugely independent life on another continent, you know, in America where everything is so different, so big and so shiny. And I loved America when I visited. I would have loved to move there. I did everything I could to try and move there when I got back and it just wasn't happening for me. So to have had all of that and then to have had to come back and be in, you know, this, this little country with your parents, all your independence stripped away in a wheelchair, that is, that is just gutting. And it sounded like she had had some kind of inpatient treatment in the past, that she had been sectioned at one point in the past, but her experiences with inpatient treatment where she was did not sound good because when I was looking at the articles and things to do with Amy, something she said was that there is no specialist ED treatment centre in Wales, in any of Wales. That is a whole country 
with no eating disorder treatment center. What the fuck? That blew my mind completely. Like, obviously, Wales is a small country, but it's big enough that it should contain an ED treatment center or two. And the councils and the people she was applying for, you know, funding to be sent to England, they were telling her, you're not sick enough. Sorry, you're not sick enough. We're not doing this. I don't know how in hell's name you can say that to someone in Amy's position, that you're not sick enough. And I'm not just talking about, you know, her graphically low weight. I'm talking about the the impact on her life as well. You know, the fact that her whole life had been stolen away from her, that she'd had to move back in with her family where she didn't sound happy. Um she clearly was sick enough. Her whole life had been taken from her. And I do wonder whether the, you know, the complete spiral that it seemed like she was in towards the end with her weight and with her behaviours and everything, was it due to being told you're not sick enough repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly? Because as I've said before, if you are ED, you've always got this, this little undermining voice in your head saying you, you are not you are not worthy of treatment. No one cares about you. You're not you're not eating disordered. Like, look at you. No one's gonna think you're eating disordered. You are not sick enough because we do equate sickness with thinness, with validation, oftentimes with being loved more at lower weights, you know, the way people sort of care about you more when you're sicker and things like that. We we have a whole bundle of feelings essentially attached to being sick enough. So when someone tells an eating disordered person, you're not sick enough for treatment, it is backing up all the lies and all the horribleness that we have in our heads and the general reaction you're going to get from an ED person if a doctor tells them you're not sick enough for treatment, our brain goes, I'll show you what sick enough looks like. I will prove it to you. And we go into a complete death spiral and our weight drops but it's completely not worth it. It is not worth it to get one up on a doctor at the expense of your health, but it's a mental illness. You can't help it. And you've just had this incredibly triggering thing said to you that, you know, your ED is already saying to you and now it's coming from the outside world and it's been confirmed in your mind and it's it's horrible. And I do wonder, is that what eventually took her life from her was this this constant invalidation. Moving on to the fundraising that Amy was doing and, and just everything that this really says about mental health care at the moment, Amy was doing everything she could to fundraise to get private treatment. But the, something that really hit me was when she'd said somewhere that what she was really after with this treatment it was CBT and a specialist ED dietitian. That was what she wanted. She wanted advice on her diet and she wanted CBT. Those are such small things to ask for, I feel like. And in Wales, they, they weren't even going to provide her those. And she had been discharged from her treatment team. Like someone in, in Amy's condition had been discharged from adult eating disorder and mental health services with with nothing no meal plan no follow ups no work and nothing they had they just left her to rot essentially it's it's just absolutely unbelievable you know i, I think mental health care in in my area is bad and in many ways it is but compared to having like nothing uh that's that's just terrifying but the, the other thing that's terrifying was when I realised the extent of the finances she needed, that the priory where she was trying to go, they charge £1,000 per day for eating disorder treatment, which means that the sum total she was trying to fundraise for her whole stay in treatment was £181,000. Now, if you're in the US, obviously dollars it's going to be a larger figure than that even in dollars. So that is the price of a house. That is the price of a house that you have to save up for treatment. And I just feel that even if she'd lived long enough, can you imagine the guilt and the shame and the self-hatred if you went through that kind of price of treatment and you came home and you had even a little, a little relapse? You would feel like, oh my, I, I've thrown away the price of a house. People from all around the world gave me money for to the tune of a house and I spend it on treatment and I'm not better. 
And it's like, it's not your fault that you're not better. It's a very, very complex, difficult to get out of condition. You have simply had pressure put on you to, to an obscene degree by the fact that the system is broken. I just don't think that adding this level of guilt, that adding finances to treatment, I don't think it's a healthy thing for anyone. I did grow up under the system where the NHS was was flawless. It was the gold standard of healthcare in the world, pretty much. I didn't even know that paid healthcare was a thing like in America, for instance, I didn't even know that was a thing until I was 16 years old. And my mind was blown. I was like, you you get sick and you go to hospital, but then they bankrupt you afterwards for that? For, be, for being sick, for breaking a leg, having a baby, you, you, you get bankrupted and homeless and all these. But you're already sick. You've got so much on your plate. You shouldn't have to be worrying about money. And for years and years and years, I would see GoFundMes and it was always from America. And I would always think, my God, the, the system is so broken. Like I so say, you, you shouldn't have to worry about money when you are fighting cancer or an eating disorder, wh whatever it is you're fighting. You've, you've got enough on your plate. You can't deal with more stress. You, this, it should be paid for by your country the way it was in my country when I was growing up. But now when I see GoFundMes and things like this, increasingly they are from the UK. Obviously, Amy lived in Wales. It was the NHS that should have been treating her. The whole thing, she should have been under an NHS eating disorder centre and she should have been able to go there for free. And as I say, it's, it sounded like she had been sectioned somewhere and they had, you know, in quotations, treated her ED there in, in the typical crappy way that a non-specialist centre will in that they will just fatten you up and throw you back out into the world, which obviously is not, it's not going to... It's not going to help an ed person. You know, it's a mental illness. The, the state of your weight really has nothing to do with it. If anything, it's going to make the state of your brain worse if you've gone from being at a weight that you're semi-comfortable at and then they've bulked you up to a weight you are profoundly uncomfortable with and they've done nothing to deal with the the thoughts and the feelings you're having. You know, it's, it's really akin to saying, look, you're an alcoholic. I'm going to lock you in a room for two weeks, the booze is all out of your system. You're blowing a zero on the breathalyzer. Um, I'm going to let you out in a pub and you're going to be fine. It, it, you have to treat the, the mental side of things when it comes to these conditions. So that had been Amy's experience of treatment under the NHS. So it's no wonder that she was, you know, like, look, I need to go somewhere really good. And it's just devastating that her body couldn't hold out long enough till she got there. And Amy is not an isolated case when it comes to the UK and the shit state of mental health care right now. I can't open my TikTok feed without tripping over videos of younger people in the UK making skits about how terrible and ranting about how terrible CAMS is. That's the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Service. So the people who deal with you until you're 16, maybe 18, they were pretty terrible when I was under them, for sure. These days, I, I, don't, I don't know who wins the battle of who's worse, adult services or child services. There was a big scandal with child and adolescent services when Theresa May was prime minister. I don't know that anything really got done about it, but something that's a repeating theme when it comes to the younger people dealing with CAMS they will be fed this whole sorry you're not sick enough thing as well when it comes to their eating disorders that it's like sorry your, your weight isn't low enough to go into treatment like people are, are literally being told that your weight is not low enough to go into treatment and that is madness that is absolute madness you know if you're in treatment right your, your goal is to apart from you know curing the brain elements of it your goal is to stabilize their weight at a healthy place so if you're trying to get someone to hear and already their weight is around here well all you've got to do is fix their brain which is you know no small feat but it's it's simpler than saying look you've got to drop down to here so that we can bring you back up to here and also treat your brain and also treat all the physical complications that you've now got and also treat the fact that your ED is far more entrenched and that you've learned far more awful, you know, coping skills through this period of extreme weight loss that we've forced you into. It's a very, very, very broken system. And postcode lotteries are a huge thing too in the UK. The, to talk about myself briefly, I cannot get the treatment I need in my area. So recently I had been looking into moving to a different city 
um, to get the treatment that I need. And I, I looked at things. I, I was quite excited for a while. I had found a flat that I really quite liked. Like it, it was a very, very dodgy city that I was going to be moving to. Like it was going to be terrifying. I was going to be away from a lot of green spaces that I like walking around and further away from my family than I would like as an autistic person, you know. Um, but what can you do if, if this is the treatment you need? It's, it's what you've got to do. And I found this flat that was like semi-communal, so it wouldn't be like, I wouldn't be so alone and it, it wouldn't be too bad. But I couldn't get that. It fell through. And then I found out more information that the Tories had made another shit decision on healthcare. And what it seemed like would happen would be if I moved to this area, I probably wouldn't get the treatment I needed anyway. So I would have uprooted myself I would be paying out the ass for rent on somewhere that I probably didn't even want to stay in anymore because what's the point if you can't get the treatment you moved there for? There was no way of me getting an assessment until I lived in the area. So I couldn't find out, look, will you treat me this way? Will you give me this treatment? I couldn't find that out until I'd moved. So it would have been this insane gamble. I spoke to so many people. I tried to say, look, can I pay for a private consultation? Can I blah, 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 blah. I tried so many things with so many people and it was just a complete dead end. And in the end, I was like, well, look, it, uh, it's too big a risk. It's too big a risk. It's too big. It's too scary. I'm not doing it. But I have no idea what that means really for me and my future and my situation I don't know. I know it's not great and I'm kind of screwed. Uh, yeah. But moving on to the uh, the NHS generally, you, you can't get away from it right now. You can't get away from the fact that the NHS is crumbling and the whole UK is terrified. Um, even one of the articles I was reading about Amy and her fundraising, as soon as I got to the bottom of her article, there was a link about the fact that a woman from Wrexham had been left to die for five hours when she'd called an ambulance. She'd been coughing up blood and she'd called an ambulance and it had taken five hours to get there. And when they got there, she was she was already gone. Um, and this is not uncommon now. Even if you get an ambulance in this country, ambulances are being used as extensions of the waiting room. So people have been left in an ambulance outside a hospital for 24 hours in some cases. The NHS was, was <laughs> even before the pandemic. But since the pandemic, you know, it, it is no good. I, I really recommend the book, This Is Going To Hurt by Adam Kay. It was recently turned into a TV thing, but I really recommend the book. He was an NHS doctor for many years, then he became a comedian. And I think the reason he put this book out finally was to illustrate, look, this is what's really going on in the NHS. This is what the underfunding, the overworking, the long hours, just, you know, the abuse from patients because of all the waiting times and all the rest of it. This is what it's doing to doctors. This is why they're all leaving for Australia or leaving the profession. This is this is what's going on. Obviously, Brexit is another element that we have barred a lot of foreign doctors and nurses who we needed and who were vital members of the NHS. We've barred them from entry because Brexit and racism. And when it comes to Amy and the reason that she was told, sorry, you're not sick enough, we're not treating you, when she clearly was sick enough... I suspect I know what happened there. Obviously, this is pure speculation, conjecture on my part. But because the NHS is in such a state right now that there aren't enough doctors, not enough nurses, not enough funding, I have heard in the papers that oftentimes hospitals are having to operate on wartime protocol, which means that if you have two patients, one of whom is very, very sick, one of whom is less sick, the resources and the staffing, it won't go to the person who has the direst need. It will go to the person who is more likely to survive. As in, they can't treat both of you, so the person who is likely to die anyway will be left to die, and they will just focus wholly on the person who is more likely to survive. When it comes to Amy and what was done to her, I do think the only possible excuse I can think of for a council to justify not giving funding to someone that sick has got to be that they've gone, look, wartime protocol, we've got to give it to someone who's going to survive. Here's someone who's only been in their ED for two years, we'll give the funding to them, they're going to survive. Amy, she's, she's been sick most of her life, she's very, very, very ill. Is she going to turn it around? We don't know. Wartime protocol, we've, we've got to give it to the healthier person. 
But to to do all of that, if they did, as I say, conjecture on my part, but I just I just can't explain it any other way. Why would you not give treatment to someone that sick if you weren't operating on this this protocol? Um but to do that if they did and then to tell that person sorry you're not sick enough it is bananas and obviously this is going to be going on all around the country the the state of eating disorder treatment in the UK has been dreadful my entire life you're okay if you live in london or in the south you're you're pretty much okay you're going to get treatment and it's going to be it's going to be quite nice and they'll treat you if you are in the north or in wales or anywhere else and particularly if you're just even just outside of a major city you're fucked for ED treatment in the UK it's just not a good place to be frankly it's it's not a good place to be mentally ill at all uh, and even even sectors of the mental health care system that were quite well funded under the labor government have now been stripped back to the bone and this, I mean, this needs its its own rant entirely, but drug addiction treatment in the UK now does not involve psychological therapy. So you're taking addiction, which is, you know, a mental illness, and they'll give you the methadone, they'll give you the suboxone, they'll stop you withdrawing, but there, there is no therapy for addicts in this country, and yet somehow they're, they're expecting people to get better. That is the Tory government. They are uncaring, eternite, snob, out of touch bastards. They need to go. Uh, sorry to fucking turn this into a political rant, but yeah, I, I wanted there to be something positive I could say in this video that, that is so bleak. Um, and the only thing I can think of is to say, for God's sake, if you're in the UK, make sure you've got your photo ID straightened out before the next election so that you can vote. Uh, I ain't going to tell you who to vote for, obviously. Uh, just, just don't vote for the fucking Tories. Not, not, not if you've got an illness yourself or someone in your family has an illness or you think you might ever get ill in the future, don't vote Tory. Um, myself, I, I would go for whoever is most tactically likely to get... Uh, the Tories out. I've, I've never really been one for voting for them previously, but tactical voting very much has my heart right now. Um, but smaller things, I think if you find yourself in this kind of situation that Amy was in with, there's no treatment in your area, you're having to fundraise and, you know, the stress on you is, is breaking your back, um, be the squeaky wheel, complain a lot um, and write letters. Do it in letter form. People are forced to listen to you. They are forced to take a breath and listen to everything you have to say if you write them a letter. So write to your MP, write to PALS, the patient liaison service um, for the NHS. Uh, I think there's a, like a complaints commission too. Um, just just keep spewing out furious letters to everyone. And if, if you can't do it yourself because it's, it's just too emotionally draining or you're dyslexic or whatever it is, um, see if you've got a friend or a family member or someone online who will take up your case or go to Citizens Advice Bureau. You might find they might be able to write a furious letter for you. But honestly, indignance and fury is not hard to summon these days. Um, and I have found that writing complaints letters has, I mean, it's literally saved my life in some cases when it's come to treatment that I wasn't going to receive or that I was going to be kicked off of. And I wrote a complaints letter and it smooth things over and I got that and I had a friend who also was being treated just unbelievably by the people she's under I wrote a furious letter for her and she managed to get some things straightened out with that so furious letters being the squeaky wheel is definitely the way to go um but it you can't it can't solve everything it cannot you know if if you're in one of these places where it is a postcode lottery and your area does not do that sort of treatment Dude, I've been battering my head off that tree for two, two and a half years now. Um, I've been writing complaints letters to to all and sundry saying, what, why do we not have this in this, this postcode bracket? Like, you know, they've got it over there. They've got it over there. Why can't we have it over here? Can someone run costs? Like, ah, and it's got me nowhere. So, you know, not, not everything is fixable. Uh, and people are dying as a result of that. It's not just the medical negligence it's also the disability system you know the welfare system that that is falling apart people are being kicked off that people are dying 
of starvation and freezing to death in their homes because their money was cut off and they were mentally ill and they did not have the capacity to fight against that decision or to do anything about it or to go to a food bank or whatever. Very vulnerable people are being screwed over in a, just a vast variety of ways by this government. And sadly, Amy Ellis was another victim of that to my mind. Um, yeah. So anyway, I will leave her the link to her TikTok below because it's got a link tree attached to it so you can see everything that's going on with her. I don't know whether anyone might set up like a charity in her name in the days and weeks that follow, so it seems worth that. But as I say, her TikTok is worth viewing anyway. I do really feel that her legacy should live on as someone who had a lot of very wise and very helpful and very brutally honest things to say about EDs that, that are genuinely powerful messages. The last thing I saw last night on TikTok was that um, her funeral details have been put out there. So anyone who knew Amy online, that's that's there too. Um, but yeah, rest in peace, Amy Ellis. I ugh, It didn't have to be that way. It did not have to be that way and it shouldn't have been that way. And I feel so bad for the intense frustration she must have gone through and just just yeah I mean I know the the sheer level of crushing self-hate you feel when you finally reach out for help and you're just told no there's 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 nothing in this area or this is how the system works you can't have it because you're not in this area this is how the system works and you went, that was my lifeline. That was that was my last lifeline. I reached out for it and I was told essentially that, that I don't matter. That's how it feels, is being told that your life doesn't matter. And I hate that she went through that. Um, it's really upsetting. So uh, yeah, her TikTok link is below. I do recommend checking it out. I'm going to shut up now. Sorry, this was so depressing and so angry. Um, but yeah. <sighs> You're all doing okay, and uh, if this has depressed you, I hope you, you go to a more cheerful patch of the internet for a while and go and debrief. Um, so, uh, yeah, see you soon. Bye-bye.